Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome Margaret Malibuis, who is one of this year's Tarrant Fellows. When we created the Dorothy Tarrant Memorial um, Fellowship a, a, a few years ago, uh, we deliberately made it open to any kind of classics at all. And as a result, uh, there's a huge field that applies every year. Um, but Margaret easily fought her way to the top over the bodies of the wounded, I hope, in the, in the room at the moment. Um, uh, to give it to give it to be one of two lecture two tarot lecturers of this year um, it's very nice indeed to have you with us uh, Margaret has Margaret is the professor of um, ancient history and Islamic studies at the uh, New Mexico State University uh, she's a, a, a trailblazer in many ways in classics um, one of her first publications was an edited volume uh, imperial projections that look at the classical culture um, in film and in popular culture more generally. And this was published in 2001, so you'll see that you know, something that is now already beginning to seep onto undergraduate courses everywhere. Uh, Margaret was in that at the start and has carried on doing that. Um, in 2009, her Ancient Roman and Modern Americans um, hit the moment exactly, and most recently, at uh, writing African Americans and the classics. Um, she's begun to uh, lead in a field that in just the last two years has become fantastically important, the question of race. You don't really uh, need to be connected to the internet for more than a couple of minutes every month to realise uh, that race and what it means for classics and the classical heritage is absolutely a hot potato at the moment, a hot potato that has burnt many fingers. Uh, not Margaret's, because she was already there heating it in the oven earlier. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, <but> those, <laughs> uh, almost every conference um, uh, that has been held in the last 12 months has spent a lot of time thinking about this and many have spent a certain amount of time getting it wrong. Uh, we, it's clearly an area where we need to do a lot of thinking, and Margaret's work has helped us enormously with that. It's really wonderful to have somebody who is a trailblazer uh, in a Dorothy Tarrant <laughs> fellowship, because Dorothy Tarrant we remember as somebody who was self a trailblazer, somebody uh, who uh, was was one of the very first, in fact, only one of, I think, only two women to have been president of both the Hellenic Society and the Classical Association, and one of a very small number uh, of women professors at the University of London and elsewhere who have been presidents of one or other of the societies which we co run the library. Um, and I think Dorothy Tarrant is somebody who we look back to and think we're very pleased she was there to get things going and Margaret is someone we look to now and say thank you so much for giving us a great lead. While a fellow here she is working uh, on the epic, a uh, decasyllable epic poem by Gaspar Pérez de Viagra uh, on the Historia de la Nueva México which shows the range of her interest but what she's going to talk about today is about visual culture, about slave, antiquity, abolition, activism Margaret, you're very welcome here. We're looking forward to your time. Thank you very much. Well, it's wonderful to be here, and as I was telling um, some colleagues, uh, that it is like a mini sabbatical. It's really wonderful to have three months uh, to just immerse myself in research and also, of course, to enjoy London, which is an incredibly wonderful cosmopolitan city and so different from New Mexico in <laughs> very good ways. Uh, oh, so let me thank uh, Greg Wolf, director of the uh, Institute, and Emma, and Joe Paul, Emma Bridges, and Valerie uh, James, who kindly printed out my talk for me today and set up the PowerPoint and has arranged all kinds of things for me uh, here. So this fellowship, the Dorothy Trent Fellowship, has given me the opportunity uh, to begin research on a new project. Um, well, actually two projects, but I'm going to be talking about just one of them today. Uh, and this project uh, will explore and analyze appropriations, and in some cases, radical transformation uh, of classical sources in ancient history by poets, artists, and novelists who are committed to African-American political economic and social equality. A central argument in the book, my recent book that Greg mentioned, um, is that knowledge of the classics was a powerful weapon and a tool <coughs> for resistance when wielded by black and white activists committed to the abolition of slavery 
and the end of social and economic uh, oppression of free blacks. My current project retains a focus on classical reception and African-American activism, but extends it from the 19th into the 20th and 21st centuries. This project will look primarily at visual and literary representations. It is grounded in and will, I hope, expand the work of, among others, John Levy Bernard, William Cook and James Tatum, Justin McConnell, Patrice Rankin, and Tracy Walters. Having arrived in London in mid-March, I would like to stress that I am very much at the beginning of this project. So I will welcome comments and questions uh, at, the, uh, at, at, at the end, but it is beginning. Today I will share with you uh, three case studies of how 19th century visual artists use classical themes to orient themselves <clears throat> and to persuade their audiences. My focus is on how this dynamic played out in the discourses around abolition and uh, race. I will examine an 1841 abolitionist portrait with a long afterlife and two startlingly different sculptures of Cleopatra. In 1839, African slaves aboard a ship called the Amistad revolted to secure their freedom while being transported from one Cuban port to another. The Africans had been kidnapped from the colony of Sierra Leone and sold to Spanish slavers. Their leader was Sanye Pie, a young Mende man popularly known in the United States as Joseph Cinque. The captured Mende people demanded that the slavers return them to Sierra Leone. When a gale drove the ship northeast along the United States coastline and the Amistad was seized off the coast of Long Island, a reporter from the New York Sun witnessed Cinque's defiance of his captures and his repeated attempts to escape. He dove from the ship and swam for 40 minutes with the ship in pursuit. When he was finally hauled on board and manacled, he addressed his fellow mutineers. A Spanish captain boy with some knowledge of the African Mende dialect translated his speech, which was recorded and published uh, in the New York Sun newspaper. Quote, friends and brothers, we would have returned to Africa, but the sun was against us. I could not see you serve the white man, so I induced you to help me kill the captain. <clears throat> you had better be killed than live many moons in misery. But this does not pain me. I could die happy if by dying I could save so many of my brothers from the bondage of the white man. Northern abolitionists formed a committee to defend the African captives. John Quincy Adams pleaded the cause of the African captives before the United States Supreme Court. And on the 9th of March, 1841, the Supreme Court issued its final verdict in the Amistad case, and the captives were cleared of charges of murder and piracy. They were freed, and they eventually returned to Africa. We can see from contemporary depictions of the Amistad uprising that the event was fiercely politicized. Amos Hewen's 1840 canvas, The Death of the Captain of the Amistad, Captain Farrer, engraved by John Barber, is in keeping with the stereotypes of the times, <clears throat> depicting the killing of the, cap the captain and crew as bestial and brutal acts committed by barbarous Africans. Captain Farrar is the picture's focal point. He is on the left, surrounded by um, four slaves, all barefoot and clad in loincloths. One slave pulls his head backwards while the other three attack him with cane knives. A cane knife is a special tool similar to a machete used to this day to cut sugar cane. <clears throat> By using the cane knife, symbol of their slave status, the slaves are reversing the biblical injunction to turn your swords into plowshares. A white member, a uh, crew member, runs from the, mur uh, from the murder but looks back in horror, while a black crew member, distinguished from the slaves by his civilized attire of jacket, trousers, and boots, attempts to flee by climbing the ribbon. The loincloths and cane knives denote savagery and slavery. The nighttime setting and the fact that the blacks outnumber the two white cr uh, crew members suggests treachery. In stark contrast is this portrait of Cinque, the leader of the revolt that originated in abolitionist circles. 
While waiting for the outcome of the trial, Robert Purvis, a wealthy black abolitionist, commissioned the portrait from the, uh, from the abolitionist painter, Nathaniel Jocelyn. Jocelyn depicted Cinque as both an African and a classical hero who stares from the canvas with a proud and dauntless look. Jocelyn left out Cinque's tattoos on his arms and chest. Instead of a loincloth, he is draped in a white cloth, leaving his right arm and shoulder bare. And instead of a servile cane knife, he holds a spear, a symbol of leadership. As newspaper articles of the Times reveal, sympathetic viewers saw the African wearing a toga, like a virtuous Roman Republican citizen. The white toga suggested that Sinque's willingness to fight to the death for liberty embodied the virtues of Cato and other Roman Republican heroes who preferred death to bondage. The newspaper, the New York Sun, pointed out that, quote, had he lived in the days of Greece or Rome, his name would have been handed down to posterity as one who has practiced those most sublime of all virtues, disinterested patriotism, and unshrinking, unshrinking courage. The representation of a heroic African also offers a striking contrast to the ubiquitous British abolition image of a kneeling black slave with up, upraised chained hands begging to be free, an image and a slogan, am I not a man and a brother, that evokes pity but locates agency in the benevolent actions of white supporters of abolition. Jocelyn Sinque won his freedom through fierce resistance to enslavement, taking up arms to combat slavers. <coughs> According to historian Marcus Redeker, when shown the painting, the Amistad Africans were, quote, delighted by the likeness of Cinque, <coughs> by his, quote, imposing <clears throat> attitude in the portrait. And when he himself saw his own image, he exclaimed, ah, good, good. Because late 18th and early 19th century sculptors typically clad the founding fathers in classical dress to show their embrace, of Roman Republican values, Jocelyn was able through the toga to associate Cinque with the early American Republic as well. Some publications like the Colored American newspaper welcomed the connection between the founding fathers and the actions of the rebel slave. Quote, this noble hero by his defense of liberty has placed himself side by side with Patrick Henry, John Hancock, and Thomas Jefferson, fathers of the revolution, end of quote. The portrait suggests that Cinque embodied both the virtues of Cato and other Roman Republican heroes who preferred death to political slavery under Julius Caesar, and the virtues of the revolutionary generation who resisted the tyranny of King George III. Cinque's willingness to fight to the death to resist slavery, however, also gave a deeper, more basic meaning to the well-known rallying cry of the American Revolution, give me liberty or give me death. The painting of the toga-clad black man exposed the hypocrisy of this rhetoric of liberty in the face of the institution of slavery. Or to put it another way, the painting and its Roman allusions made clear the vast difference between chattel slavery and slavery as a metaphor for political bondage. Other Americans were outraged at the linkage between antiquity, the virtues of the revolutionary generation, uh, with uh, Africans. They found the depiction of an African as a heroic warrior, clad in Roman dress, offensive. And Jocelyn's painting was so controversial, it was banned from its inaugural showing. <clears throat> Purvis <coughs> responded <clears throat> by um, having a mezzotint of uh, the portrait uh, made and hundreds of copies uh, were sold through the Philadelphia and the New York anti-slavery uh, societies. One owner of the mezzotint wrote in the co colored American newspaper, quote, we shall be proud to have our apartments graced with the portrait of the noble Cinque and shall regard it as a favor to our descendants to transmit to them his likeness. And who has any humanity in his heart or any veneration for a hero and who has any knowledge of this case would not want to have this likeness about them. End of quote. This portrait, uh, Cinque's portrait, uh, let's go back up to that. Um, 
played a pivotal role in the second successful anti-slaver uprising. During the fall of 1841, Madison Washington, a self-emancipated former slave from Virginia, visited Robert Purvis in Philadelphia as he was on his way back south to assist his wife's escape from bondage. Purvis had been active for several years in the Underground Railroad and had helped Washington escape to Canada two years earlier. Washington now wanted his assistance in rescuing his wife from slavery on her plantation. Washington arrived at the abolitionist home on the very same day that Nathaniel Jocelyn's portrait was delivered. And as Purvis later recounted, was, quote, intensely interested in the painting and the story behind it. When Purvis told him about Cinque and his comrades, Washington, quote, drank in every word and greatly admired the hero's courage and intelligence. Washington soon departed in search of his wife, hoping to return on his way back to Canada with his wife, but he was captured while escaping with her. He was put into chains again and placed on board a domestic slave ship called the Creole, bound for Virginia to the slave markets of New Orleans in November of 1841. The fate of his wife is unknown, though she was undoubtedly sent back into slavery. <clears throat> As the Creole set sail, Washington remembered Cinque's story, the courage, the intelligence, the plan, the victory. Working as a cook aboard the vessel, which allowed him easy communication with his shipmates, Washington began to organize. With 18 others, he rose up, killed a, a slave trading agent, wounded the captain severely, seized control of the ship, and liberated 130 fellow Africans and African Americans. Washington forced the mate to navigate the vessel to Nassau in the Bahama Islands, where the British had abolished slavery three years earlier. In Nassau Harbor, they met black boatmen and soldiers who sympathized with the emancipation from below and took charge of the Creole, supporting the rebels and ensuring their victories. Their victory. Representatives of the federal government were furious, just as those of Spain had been two years earlier following the Amistad revolt. They demanded the return of the slaves who must, they insisted, be tried in the United States for rising up to kill their oppressors. U.S. officials self-righteously defended the institution of slavery and called for all property to be returned to its rightful owners. British government, however, refused to comply with the order. Mad Madison Washington and many of his comrades gained their freedom, boarded ships, and left no further traces in the historical records. The combination of the successful Amistad and Creole rebellions had a major impact on the anti-slavery struggle, moving activists toward more militant rhetoric and practices. Some years later, in 1889, Robert Purvis recounted the connection between the portrait of Cinque and the Creole mutiny to a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer. As he gestured towards the portrait of Cinque, which hung above his desk in his sitting room in his house in Philadelphia, he told the reporter, quote, and all of this grew out of the inspiration caused by Madison Washington's sight of this picture. Well, it's certainly one of the most political portraits of the 19th century and remained ideologically potent throughout the 20th century. Now, my talk focuses on the 19th century, but I can't uh, resist showing you a couple of artworks from uh, the 1960s and 1970s of uh, black power and black arts movements. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see why in a minute. Um, so, Bromar um, Bearden, who was a co founder of a Harlem based art group, The Spiral, created a screen print titled Prince Cinque. The graphic quality of his artwork was created from cut papers, a collage technique for which he became famous. Some of you may be familiar with Bearden's Black Odyssey uh, collages. As with Jocelyn's portrait, Cinque's head and eyes turn to the left. A white strip representing his toga rests above his left shoulder, and with a deep blue background and blood red sun, and the uh, outline of the continent of Africa in the background. 
Bar Bearden referenced Barber's death of Captain Farrar woodcut illustration across the bottom of the picture frame, tying together the action of, and the image of Cinque. Clearly aware of the earlier images of the Amistad slaves by white artists, this is his remastering of them for the 20th century battle against white economic, political, and social oppression of African Americans. Hale Woodrow, a co-founder of the Spiral, painted Cinque Exhorts His Captives in 1973. Cinque wears a toga and carries a red staff. The captives hold cane knives as weapons. His right arm is raised above all, above all others, and his raised fist would have been familiar to viewers at the time as a black power uh, salute. Pictures and video footage of members of the Black Panther Party saluting one another with raised fists at rallies, conventions, and meetings circulated rapidly in the 60s, leaving no doubt as to what the symbol meant to those individuals. Another one. <clears throat> uh, but the raised fist was made internationally famous when Olympic athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists on the podium on the 16th of October in Mexico City during the Olympic Games award ceremony. Smith had won the gold medal and Carlos the bronze in the 200 meter event, running event. During the playing of the national anthem, American national anthem, each raised a black gloved fist and kept their hands raised and their heads down until the anthem had finished. They accepted their medals shoeless but wearing black socks to represent black poverty. Smith wore a black scarf around his neck to represent black pride. Carlos wore a necklace of beads, which he described were, quote, for those individuals that were lynched or killed and that no one said a prayer for, who were hung, tied, <coughs> feathered, and for those thrown off the side of the boats during the Middle Passage, end of quote. They were heartily booed as they left the stage. Smith later said, quote, if I win, I'm an American, not a black American, but if I did something bad, then they would say, I'm a Negro. We are black and we are proud of being black. Black America will understand what we did tonight, end of quote. So, oops, uh, not quite yet. So in how Woodruff's uh, painting, Cinque appears as an iconic black founding father of the black power movement. Um, this is uh, the cover of, uh, an, uh, of The Golden Legacy, which is an illustrated uh, history magazine. It was created to um, teach young blacks about their history and to instill in them uh, pride for that history. And as you can see, it featured uh, Jocelyn's Togo Clad Cinque on one of its uh, 1970s um, covers against a swirling psychedelic background. An interior image invoked uh, the Black Panther movement. It was eight raised fists uh, in chains, raised in defiance, and the words freedom or death. Jocelyn's painting remains one of the great pieces of political art. Steven Spielberg's film, Amistad, references it. Here is Cinque standing on the deck, clad in that same white toga, when lone, noble, uh, and in command. I'm going to move on now to images of a famous queen. Rather remarkably, three imposing statues of, <laughs> thank you, of Cleopatra were displayed at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876, evoking very different responses from viewers. From their readings of classical texts, many African Americans and their supporters argued for a distinct connection between ancient Africa, that is Ethiopia and Egypt, and the classical world. They argued that Egypt was a major source of the cultural achievements of Greco-Roman antiquity, and by extension, white European civilization. They further claimed that ancient Egyptians were black, and that modern African Americans were the racial descendants of ancient Egyptians. By the 1860s, it had become a commonplace in American abolitionist circles that antiquity's most famous queen was a black Egyptian, 
<coughs> begin with uh, William uh, Wetmore's stories. Um, Cleopatra, he was an emigre uh, artist uh, living in Rome on the eve of the American Civil War. And while he was there, he sculpted um, this uh, Cleopatra, and he made a number of copies uh, of, of this uh, Cleopatra uh, as, as, as well. Now, it was received as startling and original because it deviated from classicizing portraits of the queen and represented her with Egyptian, read African, uh, features. Story intended his Cleopatra to be a provocative abolitionist statement. While we, 21st century viewers, struggle to see Story's Cleopatra as black, this was indeed how critics and spectators viewed it. In a letter to his father, Charles Francis Adams, Henry Adams said of the statue, quote, it is something so original that I can, can't help dilating on it a little. Cleopatra is an Egyptian woman, not a Grecian or Italian girl. The Bostonian clergyman uh, and author Edward Everett Hale similarly commented in a letter to a friend, quote, as you look at the statue, remember she is an African a line of Egyptian mothers from ten generations have made her wholly Egyptian. In this raving hot blood of hers, in this passionate temper, and in the whole quality even of her mind, it was no pretty Greek beauty that worked such havoc with men such as those. You are looking, my dear, at an African queen, and her sway is broken now, and Europe is thundering at the gates of her citadel, and if you will consent that Egypt shall typify Africa for you, you may make this the symbol of Africa's despair. <clears throat> End quote. Uh, another art critic uh, and art collector, James Jar Jackson Jarvis, appreciated the abolitionist sympathies of Story's statue, but he pointed out that uh, she, he was certain that she was Greek, uh, not um, African. Story was fortunate in that Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Marble, Marble Fawn lavished praise on and framed how viewers saw Story's Cleopatra. English-speaking tourists used the novel as a sort of tour guide to the artistic splendors of Rome. Hawthorne had lived in Rome, was a friend of Story, and Story appears thinly disguised in the novel as the sculptor Kenyon who creates a statue of the Egyptian queen with African features. Quote, this is from the novel. The sculptor Kenyon had not shunned to give the full Nubian lips <clears throat> and other characteristics of the Egyptian physiognomy. His courage and integrity had been abundantly rewarded, for Cleopatra's beauty shone out richer, warmer, and more triumphantly, beyond comparison than if, shrinking timidly from the truth, he had chosen the tame Grecian type. In a word, all Cleopatra, fierce, voluptuous, passionate, tender, wicked, terrible, and full of poisonous and rapturous enchantment. She would be one of the images that men keep forever, finding a heat in them which does not cool down through the centuries. <clears throat> Obviously, this is a Cleopatra freighted with uh, familiar Orientalist images uh, that go back to Octavian's smear campaign against her during the third and final Roman Civil War. They've been frequently recycled and deployed over the centuries, and in the 1850s and 1860s, they were at times conflated with racist views about the supposed uh, excessive and insatiable black sexuality. Hawthorne's novel added a further detail to his narrative on the statue. Cleopatra had dressed to seduce Octavian, quote, to kindle a tropic fire in the cold eyes of Octavian. Her slumped uh, repose, I'll come back to this in a minute, her slumped uh, repose <clears throat> was, quote, the repose of despair. Indeed, for Octavian had seen her and remained insensible to her enchantments. Scorned by Octavian, unable to seduce and ensnare the Roman general, Cleopatra acknowledges defeat and despondently contemplates her next move. <clears throat> Story and his biographer, Henry James, reported that visitors to his Roman studio would bring copies of the marble fawn, 
which they would read aloud while viewing the sculpture. Hawthorne was cognizant of the power of his novel to affect the course of Story's career when he wrote to a friend stating, look well at Story's Cleopatra, for you will meet her again in one of my chapters, which I wrote with great pleasure. If he does not find himself famous, henceforth the fault will be none but mine. I have at least done my duty to him. So Story's audience uh, were provided a key to the sculpture, the narrative, and the meanings <coughs> he wished to deploy, meanings derived from the premise uh, that this Cleopatra's body was black. Story sold the first version of Cleopatra at the 1862 International Exhibition in London and subsequently was commissioned to produce uh, over the next 14 years four copies uh, of the original. Now, he was equally known in his, uh, his day as a poet and a writer as well as an artist. And while he, he was sculpting his next Cleopatra, he wrote a lengthy poem uh, that he meant to accompany the statue, uh, and it was entitled Cleopatra. And it is a remarkably lurid, even turgid poem in which the queen, a spiritual ancestress of the formidable Aisha from H. Ryder Haggard's She, remembers passionate sex with Antony and daydreams of a sexual reunion with him. In the poem, she entertains the amorous conceit that they had been lovers when they were tigers in a previous incarnation. Here's an excerpt. <laughs> that was a life to live for, not this weak human life with its frivolous, bloodless passions and its poor and petty strife. Come to my arms, my hero. The shadows of twilight grow, and the tiger's ancient fierceness in my veins begin to flow. Come not cringing to sue me. Take me with triumph and power as a warrior storms a fortress. I will not shrink or cower. Come as you came in the desert, ere we were women and men, when the tiger passions were in us, and love me as you love to the end. <laughs> Um, this jungle imagery of this Victorian erotic fantasy equates African origins with animal sexuality, using Cleopatra as a symbol of fierce sexual passion. Uh, story links Cleopatra's animal sexuality to Egypt uh, and, to, uh, and, and to Africa. So the question needs to be asked, of course, would an American, African-American woman have recognized herself in the features of Story's Queen, uh, it's highly unlikely that she would. Um, as Charlene Nelson has pointed out uh, in her uh, 2007 work, The Color of Stone, Sculpting the Black Female Subject in 19th Century America, quote, the black female of America and the diaspora was the impossible subject the no body of neoclassical sculpture, or at least sculpture whose intention was to rally moral indignation or represent beauty. She continues, story made Cleopatra black enough to evoke danger and to provide sexual titillation, but white enough to register beauty. Her body was as much an index of the impossibility of a full-blooded Negro female type in high art as it was an indication of the endemic Euro-American ignorance of the ancient and contemporaneous differences between African and African diasporic subjects." So it was one thing uh, to gesture towards perhaps uh, African features and quite another to portray Cleopatra as a black woman that contemporary African Americans would recognize uh, as, as black. Stories Cleopatra played on exotic elements of the Cleopatra myth to elicit sympathy from a predominantly white viewing audience. Stories' emphasis on the wild animal sexuality of Cleopatra, together with Hawthorne's emphasis on her defeat at the hands of the icily rational Octavian, suggests that despite the appeal to abolitionist sympathies, his despairing Cleopatra provides reassurance that the passionate African animal female will always be subordinate to the cold, conquering white male gaze of Octavian and his successors. 
The second Cleopatra and the last section of this talk uh, it was the work of Edmonia uh, Lewis, uh, 1876, the date should be there. Um, <clears throat> her mother was uh, a Chippewa Indian, her father uh, a Black West Indian. Her sculpture, uh, it, it was colossal, uh, over 300 pounds uh, of Carrara marble. Uh, the sculpture of the dying queen <clears throat> shocked and fascinated critics and spectators. It was displayed at the 1876 uh, Centennial Exhibition uh, in, uh, in, in Philadelphia. And at the same time, one of Story's uh, Cleopatra's copies was also displayed um, at the same uh, exi uh, exposition. Um, one uh, newspaper reported that, quote, the statue excites more admiration and gathers larger crowds around it than any other work in the vast uh, collection of the exposition. Critics noted how different her Cleopatra was from the typical artistic and literary portrayals of the Egyptian queen. Lewis's Cleopatra did not strike viewers as another example of a seductive erotic representation of the Egyptian queen. Her Cleopatra was neither African nor beautiful. In her research for her sculpture, she studied Roman coins, and as noted by critics, gave Cleopatra an aquiline, or as it was known at the time, a Roman uh, nose. She sculpted Cleopatra in the act of suicide at the very moment of her death. This is uh, a view of a body dying. Her death was not perceived as a serene death of the sentimentalized kind typical of Victorian sculpture. Art critic William Clark, his response to Lewis's sculpture was ambivalent. Quote, this was not a beautiful work, but it was very original and even striking, and it deserves particular comment. The effects of death are represented with such skill as to be absolutely repellent, and it is a question whether a statue of the ghastly characteristics of this one does not overstep the boundaries of legitimate art. Apart from all questions of taste, however, the striking qualities of the work are undeniable, and it could only have been reproduced by a sculpture of very genuine endowments. The real power of her Cleopatra was a revelation. So then the view. Repellent, ghastly, striking, of questionable taste, powerful. The sculpture of the dying queen provoked unease and admiration. There was something uncomfortably intimate, even voyeuristic, about visually witnessing Cleopatra in the throes of death. And Monia Lewis is a fascinating and little-known figure, and so I want to take a couple of minutes uh, to describe uh, her remarkable life. <clears throat> she was raised uh, mixed race, raised in Catholic, uh, raised as a Catholic in Canada and then New York State, and orphaned uh, at a young age. Her older brother arranged for her to go to Oberlin College <clears throat> in the early 1860s, and she left Oberlin under very traumatic circumstances. Um, one night she had uh, drunk wine with fellow, uh, two, fe two fellow white students, which she did not do at Oberlin College. Uh, and the two white students then went out for a sleigh ride with two young men on chaperone. And they became seriously ill, the, the two young women, and they accused Ammonia Lewis of having poisoned the wine with an aphrodisiac, the Spanish, a Spanish fly. Um, outraged at the accusation and the lack of scrutiny of the young men uh, who, uh, who were with the uh, students, uh, a black uh, lawyer, uh, uh, John Mercer Langston, agreed to take on her case pro bono <clears throat> and uh, defended her. But just before the trial in the winter of 1862, she was attacked at night by a mob. She was savagely beaten, she was stripped, uh, she was probably raped uh, and left for dead in a frozen field. She was so severely injured that she had to be carried to her trial. And although she was exonerated, uh, she was unable to graduate as the college refused to let her re-enroll. So she left Ohio, <laughs> went to Boston, uh, interacted with some uh, abolitionists, uh, studied with a, with a sculptor uh, there, but she found life in Boston untenable as well. She told a New York Times reporter later 
quote, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had no room for a colored sculptor, end quote. With the money she earned from uh, a bust she'd made of the white abolitionist hero, Robert Gould Shaw, she sailed to Europe in August of 1865. Her passport application listed her as a four foot tall, she's very short, a woman of black complexion. Uh, she went to London, she went to Paris, she went to Florence, and she ended up in Rome in 1866, where she remained for um, the rest of her life with a few trips back to the United uh, States. She was an outsider there. Uh, it wasn't just her mixed race, uh, she was also um, poor. Uh, and most of her fellow artists uh, in Rome were white uh, and uh, wealthy. There were a few white women sculptors at work in the city who reached out to her, uh, including the well-known sculptor Harriet Hosmer. Um, but Henry James belittled all of them by collectively referring to them as the white Marmorian flock. And the art critic James Jarvis, who disapproved on principle, it seems, of women sculptors in general, singled out Lewis for special scorn. Quote, one of the sisterhood was a negress whose color, picturesquely contrasting with that of her plastic material, was the pleasing agent of her fame. Very snide. Um, uh, she created a space for herself within this exclusive and competitive world of 19th century neoclassical uh, sculpture and embarked um, on a uh, career, and she became well-known. Uh, and her studio was a stop for many on the uh, grand tour. Uh, Frederick, Frederick Douglass uh, visited her. Uh, former President Ulysses uh, Grant sat for her. She made busts of John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, and her sculptures were of Native, uh, Native Americans. Uh, she was inspired by uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's um, 1855 poem, the, S the Song of Hiawatha. And she sculpted uh, a series of marble sculptures of Hiawatha and Minnehaha. Uh, she sculpted a Hagar, a beautiful statue of the biblical Hagar. And she uh, sculpted um, uh, abolitionists. So her peers, her white wealthy peers, could patronize artistic ambition, um, prioritize, excuse me, artistic ambition over patronage and sales. She had to work for a living, and she began uh, sculpting copies of canonical artworks to sell uh, to, uh, to tourists. Now, to get back to the statue, um, which was the crown of her work, and it's the only one that engages with a classical subject, and it was her submission to the Centennial Exposition in 1876, the death of Cleopatra, which took her four years uh, to complete. Scholars have struggled to understand her choice of subject and her arresting portrayal of the dying queen. I will not rehearse the scholarship here, but instead will suggest what I think are some fruitful ways to think about Lewis's sculpture. As an artist living in Rome, she was certainly familiar with artistic representations of the Egyptian queen, including, of course, uh, William Whitmore's stories, Cleopatra. Lewis's encounters with other portrayals of Cleopatra may well have left her feeling that white male sexual fantasies of a long dead queen trumped any positive ethnic and spiritual ties to an ancient African civilization. It seems probable that her decision to sculpt a white Cleopatra in control of her own fate was deliberately calculated to strip away her legendary sexual allure and its contemporary racist associations with black female sexuality, and to replace it with messages of dignity, strength, and resistance. Lewis advertised her sculpture to an international audience by publishing a promotional pamphlet. And in the pamphlet, she reprints some excerpts from Plutarch's Life of Antony, as well as a poem by Thomas Collier, an American uh, poet, called Cleopatra Dying, 
which represents Cleopatra's suicide after the Battle of Actium as a refusal to be captured and displayed in Octavian's triumphal procession in Rome. Rather than endure a forced journey over the Mediterranean from Egypt to Rome, Collier's Cleopatra calls on the strength of her dynastic association to foil Octavian's triumph. Here's a, just a brief excerpt from the poem. He shall never say, I met him, fawning, abject, like a slave. I will foil him, though to do it I must cross the Stygian wave. By the end of the poem, her resistance to Octavian culminates in her decision to die, quote, free, proud, and triumphant, the last sovereign of my race. When Lewis created Cleopatra triumphant in death, freed from Rome's imperial grasp, she may well have celebrated a woman's self-determination and freedom from bondage, a woman she recognized as mirroring her own fierce independence and resilience. Lewis's fame um, faded. She fell out of the spotlight. Many of her sculptures are now lost. The details of her death were only recently discovered. She died in London in 1907. She earned the prestige of the New York Times book uh, obituary, but not until the 25th of July, 2018, um, <clears throat> in the overlooked section of the obituary page. Her Cleopatra was similarly overlooked. After the exposition, it appeared at a Chicago saloon, marked a horse's grave at a suburban racetrack, then disappeared and eventually reappeared at a salvage yard in the 1980s, where it was discovered by a firefighter who rescued it and had his Boy Scout troop paint it purple and white. It has since been restored and is in the Smithsonian Collection of American Art in Washington, D.C. As African-American scholars and artists work to reclaim the heritage of previous generations of black artists, Agmonia Lewis has reclaimed her role as a focal point of dialogue about race. As her 2018 obituary says, quote, in the century since her death, Lewis as an idea, the artist as proxy uh, for her race and gender, whose work can only be seen through those two prisms, would trip up her champions and muddy her biography. That includes modern day critics, those who would cast her still as a picturesque exotic, as one or else as a subversive feminist who embedded her work with gendered themes or as a racial activist." End quote. In addition to attracting critical analysis, Lewis inspired a remarkable tribute from Tahimba Jess um, who devotes several poems to her in his 2017 Pulitzer Prize winning collection, Olio. And I would like to conclude by reading um, one of them. And here's uh, the only um, image we have of Antonia um, Lewis in the picture. This is the handout, um, The Death of Cleopatra, Edmonia Lewis, Marble, 1876. She reached into the ground with saw and sluice, chiseled me down from mountainous until I was almost mortal, perched me in the throne of life's last promise. She fashioned me a legend unlocked from Earth's history. Her brown hands bore me alabaster smooth from rubble to royalty, and birthed me into the breach of my last breath, baptized me in the burn of her sweat over my every ripple and curve, to teach me love like the blows of a million small hammers in search of the stillborn heart. And while she polished my demise with pumice and her slow grinding work song of muscle and scrape, I learned the labor of a queen robbed of country, of a creator who carves her story into the face of all she beholds, and bids it shine until death's garden of stone is ground to life. In this poem, Jess gives Lewis's statue a voice, which the statue uses to eulogize her creator. The childless Lewis is cast as both a mother and an artist, bringing her marble creation to the verge of life in terms that evoke childbirth birthed me into the breach of my last breath, baptized me in the room of her sweat, 
over my every ripple and curve. Cleopatra is recast, transcending the historical queen to become primordial, quote, a legend unlocked from Earth's history. The narrating statue situates Lewis in the history of slavery, emphasizing unceasing hard physical labor and referencing slave work songs, her slow, grinding work song of muscle and scrape. Lewis's toil and patient polishing educate her marble art spring, who learns a history that is at once her own and her creator's. Quote, I learned the labor of a queen robbed of country, of a creator who carves her stone into the face of all she beholds. Jess rewrites the story of the tragic Egyptian queen, centering his poem on the artist who conceived and labored over the statue. Antony and Caesar are discarded. Cleopatra and Lewis have agency and voice. Cleopatra's defeat is not erased, but it is backgrounded, subsumed by the reclamation of black female creativity and resilience. Thank you.